Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. My name is Harit Boglu, and I'm part of the American Clubs Business Development Team. And I would like to welcome you all to the American Clubs Loss Prevention Webinar. As you already know, this webinar will be about maritime cybersecurity. Now, before we get started, I would like to go through just a few small housekeeping items, which you can also see on the share screen. To begin with, please note that the microphones and cameras will be disabled during the course of this webinar. However, please feel free to use Zoom's q and feature at the top of your screen, right here at the bottom of your screen, to type in your questions at any time throughout the presentations. Please note that the PDF copy of this webinar's presentation, along with its accompanying materials, will be sent out to all participants in a follow-up email, along with a brief questionnaire. Meanwhile, please note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the club's YouTube channel. However, please allow us one to two business days for the webinar recording to be posted. Now, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And without any further ado, I would like to introduce you, your moderator for today's webinar, Dr. William Moore, Global Loss Prevention Director of the American PNA Club. So, Bill, over to you. Thank you, Jadis. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our second webinar on the subject of uh, maritime cybersecurity uh, related issues uh, in, during the era of viruses that we've called it between uh, maritime secure, sorry, maritime or sorry, uh, cyber cyber related vibra viruses as well as as um, COVID nineteen. It's quite an issue for our industry and uh, uh, us and our personal lives alike. So first I'd like to introduce today's speakers, uh, which you see uh, across your panel there. Uh, the first of them being Mr. Ian Bramson, from, uh, who's the global head of, of cybersecurity at ABS Group. Mr. Dennis Hackney, head of cyber solutions development at ABS Group. And you also have uh, Ms. Alina Soli, who's the business development director for Europe, Middle East, um, and uh, sorry, Middle East and A, the last A, I don't keep, keep, keep forgetting what that actually means, but uh, pr primarily for Europe, an FD&D manager, and also uh, is based in, in uh, Piraeus at SCB Hellas. And myself, Dr. William Moore, head of loss prevention uh, for the American PNI Club. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Alina uh, to, to give you a, a couple of words with regard to the club, the organization, and then we'll move on from there. Alina? Yes, uh, thank you, Bill. Hello from me as well, and welcome to our uh, cybersecurity webinar today. Uh, just a couple of words from my side. In the American Club, we are working closely with our members as well as our market, market stakeholders on a 24-7 basis in order to provide first-class service and contribute to creating industry awareness regarding all principles that are closely connected to a sustainable future for the industry at large. Within that context, we have developed various loss prevention programs which uh, primarily focus on knowledge sharing initiatives and uh, facilitate close synergies with other industry st stakeholders in order to formulate guidelines on emerging risks. So today we are very proud of our collaboration uh, with ABS uh, on the subject of uh, cybersecurity, which is indeed a risk that needs special attention as uh, cybersecurity incidents have increased at an alarming uh, risk rate over the last decade. I'm sure Bill will share with you later on uh, and elaborate further on the various loss prevention initiatives uh, that his department has uh, developed over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Um, I'd like to give a couple moments to uh, Ian Bramson to give uh, an introduction uh, into ABS Group and what ABS Group is doing on the maritime security, uh, cybersecurity side. They're doing some excellent work, doing a lot of uh, educating of the industry, including educating of the American Club on the subject. So Ian, without further ado, please. Well, thank you, Bill, and thank you for having us on 
Um, we've been working with the American Club for a little over a year now, um, really trying to raise awareness about cybersecurity, uh, especially when it comes to maritime and the OT environment. OT is the operational technology environment. We'll get a little bit more into that in a bit. But this risk has, has been growing exponentially. And we know that it hits every part of that value chain, um, meaning every piece from when you're doing ship construction all the way through management um, and throughout. And it's new for maritime. It's a new area for everybody. Uh, it's new for the bad guys. It's new for the good guys. And the best thing we can do right now uh, when it focuses on loss present prevention is education and awareness. And we've done a number of things together uh, and I'm very proud of what we've all accomplished together uh, so far in raising that awareness. Uh, today, we thought we would take it a little bit differently. We're gonna take it from the hacker's point of view, which we thought that would be much more interesting for folks uh, to understand people understand. So we're going to have um, Dr. Dennis Hackney, uh, who leads our solutions development team, uh, walk through some scenarios uh, about what it would take to actually, quote unquote, hack or get into a ship. He's going to be focusing, as I, said, as I said before, on the operational technology side, getting into the parts of a vessel that uh, could do real world damage, meaning things like navigation or ballast systems, those kinds of things. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it to Dennis here and have him set up his scenarios. Dennis? Thanks Ian. Um, can you see my presentation screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks for having us here today, um, Bill and others. Uh, we're going to talk about two scenarios today um, from kind of a hacker's point of view. Uh, one of them is going to be for uh, dynamic positioning. The other one's going to be for load or ballast control uh, integrated system. Uh, so I'm going to talk through those relatively quickly. Um, and then we're going to open it up for questions through the, the message panel, I believe, after. Um, so the first scenario, it's a system that on vessels is, is highly complex and highly integrated and is leading to more autonomous activities on vessels. And so that's why we brought it up. Um, it's the dynamic positioning. In this scenario, we're specifically talking about dynamic positioning on an offshore support or supply vessel. Um, there in it, near our area, there uh, is a lot of supply vessels in the Gulf of Mexico. This is one that's pretty popular for us to talk about, but they also exist in, in you know, multiple regions of the world. Um, this specific scenario, we're going to talk about the importance of control over the DP and then um, what can happen if you lose control over the DP. And I'm going to start a little bit with um, something that occurred in 2015 that, ro uh, 2015 that rose the awareness um, for redundancy or the requirement for redundancy in the dynamic positioning. And in uh, Outer Continental Shelf uh, collision occurred um, based off of loss of control of a DP that wasn't redundant. And um, our Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement and the US Coast Guard had released a joint uh, safety alert that recommended that most operators and most, most uh, ship owners actually install a DP2 system, which meant that they had a redundant system. And so this is important because uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what the redundancy is and, and, and how, even though uh, when you're testing and proving one of these systems, um, you may not be considering the redundancy or the type of security safeguards that's re that are required for cybersecurity. Um, so an overview, um, the redundant system is a, a DP or DPS2, depending on uh, who, who's actually proving your system. Um, so for our example, we'll call it a, a DPS2, uh, equipment class two. Now this system actually has multiple reference points. Uh, and so I used uh, an image here to show you that. We're gonna specifically talk about um, some computerized or cyber enabled systems or sensors or control port, uh, components within the DP system because the topic here is computers and viruses. 
Um, and these examples are typically computerized in, in most of the DP systems that you see today on modern vessels. That's a GPS reference, um, laser or point of sight reference, and then um, hydroacoustic or seafloor sea floor reference um, in, in our specific example. And so as you, as you can see, there are more references. Um, you've got the, the wire reference, wind sensors, things like that, that control you know, pitch roll the heading of the vessel, um, everything that's uh, required to maintain station keep and keeping uh, of the vessel. And so let's go ahead and talk through it. Um, I've simplified um, the network connectivity drawing for a common DP system. So I'm going to talk really quickly about what that looks like. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how the cyber uh, event will occur. Um, and so just for reference, up in the upper left-hand corner, there's a mirror image of the larger image, and that's supposed to represent the redundant components. Um, and then it connects to a, a switch, which is a basic ethernet or network switch. Typically the switches used here are marine grade. Um, they, may, they may have some kind of a type approval um, but they're not necessarily designed for access control rules or firewall uh, rules or security. Uh, and then connected to that switch, we have the kind of control and view component, the workstation or workstations. Um, and those typically have the application uh, for the DP system. And then further on that, it connects to the sensor controller, which we have it called here a DP sensor unit. That could be a programmable logic controller. It could just be a simplified unit that basically just takes in the reference signals from the hydroacoustic uh, laser reference, uh, GPS, and other uh, sensors. And then it uses that to interpret the data to, to maintain position. And then off towards the left and towards the bottom, we have another PLC, which we're calling DP control unit. Which actually uses, uh, which actually sends out signals to the thrusters and the main engines and the rudders and others, um, and that also connects to the power management for communication. And this will actually control those devices. So if you send uh, control from the workstation at the top out through the system or from the joystick panel, um, what have you, that will actually turn the rudder or engage the thrusters and so on. Um, and so we're going to talk through the scenario. Now, mind you, this is an example only. Um, this is not an actual cyber event, but we're going to talk through how this could occur. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I chose this specific scenario. Um, and so what happens here is when we start, um, any kind of a USB or any kind of a connection uh, to that workstation can introduce a virus. And we see viruses that are more... Uh, obvious, we can say, um, that are, look like ransomware, things that uh, encrypt your hard drive and then put a phone number or email address or something on the screen or web address or something on the screen that says, we will decrypt your information, but you have to pay us hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, depending on the organization. Or we have something that's a little bit more um, benign uh, as far as are, are hidden, let's say, as far as what the operator actually knows is going on. Um, and this, this is something more like a bot, um, a, a virus that worms through the network, something that can cause a catastrophe, but attempts to go unnoticed. And these, these, these are somewhat sophisticated, um, but in this specific example, if you want to cause damage, this would probably be a better option. And that is why I picked it for this one. This, this is actually introduced during a maintenance event and goes completely unnoticed. What happens is this workstation becomes uh, essentially a bot master. Um, so what that means is it's, it's a robot um, and it starts, to be, uh, it starts to develop a network. The master starts to send out signals throughout the network and it looks for other devices on the network to infect and then spread as well. Um, and what's interesting about bots or botnet type viruses now, you know, present time is that um, 
we're finding that threat actors are installing these types of applications on more than just computers. So we're they're installing them on um, switches. If the if the switch has a an operating system, they're installing on cell phones. Uh, they're installing on technologies. They they take relatively small hard drive space or small amounts of space and resources, um, but they cause mayhem and disruption. What happens here is you follow the red lines is during a DP uh, station keeping event, that botnet calls out. So it sends a message out to the network to spread. Um, and it can do that at this time because it's set on a timer or it's set to uh, do this whenever a certain event occurs. It goes completely unnoticed most of the time because the DP system really isn't active. But once it's active, and this sends out, then the next thing you know is all those position references are being compromised. So I've got the dot dash dash line there. Um, and this is very critical because during that station keeping event, when that signal gets sent out or that message gets sent out, these unsophisticated uh, network or IT type components within the DP control system cannot handle the, that type of traffic. And so it could cause the, the, the thrusters to surge and the engines to surge and the steering to lose control. And this could you know, result in a collision of some sort um, or some sort of event that could eventually lead to a catastrophe. And that's why we, and that's why we try to point that out. Now, one thing to reiterate on this scenario is completely plausible. Um, the workstations and most of the IT components in the DP system are just like anything you would see in a network or a computer uh, in, in an IT environment. There's no difference whatsoever. And most of them are not designed as sophisticated um, with cybersecurity controls as what you would see on an IT network. Um, so let's move on to our next scenario. Uh, our next scenario, what we're looking at is the, the load system and the ballast system on, on a container ship here. And in many cases, these systems are interconnected. So it depends on, on who, how this was procured and how it was built during the commissioning of the vessel. But many of these are connected through networks um, and they're completely integrated. And so that's why we're picking on this, these specific systems. Again, a plausible scenario. Um, and one that you'll see gets called out uh, sometimes in modern events. And, and so there, there was a recent event that happened in September where the, the owner specifically said, this is not what occurred in their systems just because they wanted to point that out. Um, but in my example here, uh, I have a working system. So I'm gonna talk you through the working system. I have a, actual, a view of the container ship with the water line in the middle, uh, container ship next to the port, uh, and are next to the dock, and then a uh, ballast workstation, load planning workstation in the middle, and then uh, the screen of the ballast control station at the bottom. So this is representative, and I drew this. It's not an actual screenshot. Now, as cargo gets unloaded, what happens is the load planning workstation communicates with the ballast workstation, and together, um, as cargo is offloaded, the ballast workstation uh, balances out or the ballast system balances out the ballast tanks and then the vessel maintains its uh, its depth and position um, whatever is necessary for stability and to relieve stresses of the hull um, and because it looks like it's working properly the chief officer or chief mate actually continues this and they unload the vessel you'll notice that the bottom screen uh, matches the actual tanks the side tanks are the same uh, they have the same volume, everything matches. It's accurately cal calibrated. Uh, what that means is uh, the load plan uh, and the weights match what the ballast system's using to calibrate the amount of volumes in the tanks and everything works properly. Now, in our cyber event, what happens is <clears throat> the the load plans and uh, the information that gets loaded into the, the um, load sy loading system is actually actually sent from uh, shore to ship. 
Um, and typically those are actually transmitted through email. And <clears throat> there are examples where it can be communicated with a thumb drive or USB drive uh, and transmitted that way. Um, but this is a very common practice where it's communicated through email, copied to a drive, and then plugged in uh, to the system to update. Now, because it's communicated through email, it's actually an IT, this is actually an IT cyber event uh, that results in a, a cyber incident that's a non-IT related cyber incident. Um, and the reason this can happen is because those files, those EDI are in an uh, EDI format, but, and I've kind of explained it here a little bit, that's open or clear text. And so there, there is a lot of EDI editors, easy ways to modify these files, and it can go relatively unnoticed. And if you're using email, as most of us do every day, we know that you could send an email and you could receive it you know, 30 seconds later or five minutes later, there's really an expectation there that there will be a delay. Uh, and so this compromise could actually occur by capturing that email uh, as a man in the middle attack, modifying the files very quickly, changing a couple of uh, letters. Like in our example here, we're changing from uh, kilograms to pounds um, and then retransmitting that file as if it had gone unnoticed. And if you think this can't happen, I will tell you firsthand, we've actually seen uh, where email, not where this has occurred, but where email uh, addresses have been spoofed and it appears that emails are coming from local internal Active Directory users where they resolve their names and everything. And in fact, they were malicious actor, uh, threat actors who had compromised just the address. Uh, and the only indicators that we had that they were actually uh, fabricated emails was just poor grammar in the email and uh, different triggers that didn't quite sound right, like asking for large sums of money. So this EDI file gets loaded into the Lodicator. Um, and then the next thing you know, we're gonna talk through how the cyber incident can occur. Everything looks normal. Um, when this starts, our, our load planning software sends the signal to the ballast control. And you'll notice that the ship's ballast tanks and our screen look the same up to this point. And so we continue with it. And this is, this is where things start to become dangerous because we want it to appear, let's say if we're doing something nefarious, we want it to appear normal at first. So there's no indication that there's a fault. He continues. Now, because that rate has changed, um, our screen looks proper. Like, so our, our ballast screen looks like our tanks are filled up properly. However, we'll notice that one tank didn't fill all the way. And what that's gonna do is cause the vessel to lean. And when that happens, we start to lose uh, control of the vessel. And this could end up, uh, this could end up uh, with lack of stability and cause a torsional stress on the vessel. Now this is kind of uh, a simple scenario, but this could happen um, in different cases when you know the ship's actually moving or, or what have you. And we know that um, not cyber related, of course, but multiple events have occurred in the past where, where uh, ships have dropped containers and tilted. And you can see images like this all over the web. Uh, so that's the sum of the scenarios that we're gonna share today. Um, and like I said, these are absolutely plausible scenarios. Uh, we wanted to share that with you without any cybersecurity controls in place, these can actually happen on most vessels that at least we see today. So I'm gonna pass it back over to uh, uh, Bill and we'll continue from there. Thank you for that excellent presentation, Dennis. And uh, it's interesting to see the types of exposures that we actually have. And we'll come back to more of that at the, at the end of the uh, near the end of the session. But for the time being, I'd like to hand this over now to Alina, uh, who will give us a PI perspective, a PI and FDD perspective on the issue of cybersecurity. And I hand it off to you, Alina. Uh, thank you, Bill. I, I guess you can all see my screen. Yes. Um, 
Over the last uh, years, as we previously said, the maritime industry has depends more and more on, on automation and uh, technologies to improve efficiency. And this practice has indeed created an enhanced threat of security risks due to hacking or sabotage. So this has become very relevant to the PNI world as, uh, as well, as we have seen very serious incidents over the last decade. Uh, the eye opener, I think, for the industry was uh, the incident with Maersk back in uh, 2017 that caused a huge disruption to its operation and worldwide terminals and resulted to accumulated losses of over 300 million. Um, so from, uh, from the PNI uh, perspective, uh, when, when we are talking on uh, PNI cover, what we need to, to have in mind at all, uh, at all times is that the, the PNI insurance aims to cover third party liabilities. And those are liabilities are expressly outlined in the relevant rules of all IG uh, clubs. In the, per the perception of uh, the PNI insurance, which is, uh, has a unique characteristic, and that is, uh, this is an insurance cover that has indeed been created by the ship owners for ship owners. So it's a unique situation where we have an insured who is uh, also the insurer. Uh, but apart from uh, the PNI, uh, we also provide FDND cover, which can also uh, be related to incident with uh, including cybersecurity, which I will elaborate further later on. Uh, but what uh, we we all need uh, to know is that the FDND cover provides uh, only for the legal costs uh, when dealing with a wide variety of uh, issues and disputes that may arise from the operation of the entered vessel. And in, in this occasion, uh, the cover is discretionary and it depends on various uh, factors that have to be considered uh, when deciding whether to pursue or not uh, a claim. Um, so how, how would uh, the PNI cover and FDND as well would respond to an incident uh, of a cyber attack? Uh, we, we have to know that uh, within the international group clubs uh, and their uh, respective rules, there is no um, exception for cybersecurity and uh, relevant events are covered under normal PNI, uh, with, the, with the only exception when these are related to act of war or uh, terrorism. The common element uh, between the, the PNI world and uh, cyber risk is the human factor. Human error is a significant factor contributing to PNI related incidents as well as uh, cyber attack losses. Actually, cybercrime managed to find gaps uh, which are mostly related to human disregard and lack of awareness and adequate training. Uh, and therefore, over the last uh, decade, there has been a significant uh, increase uh, of uh, the uh, reported uh, cyber attacks. Uh, recently, there has been a report that uh, uh, close to 17 million attacks uh, are incurring per week. So we can uh, all uh, appreciate uh, the magnitude of, uh, of the problem. Uh, but nevertheless, despite uh, the absence of any cyber exclusions within the PNI rules, uh, the member has the duty to act as a prudent uh, uninsured. And uh, within that context, you should take measures to reduce vulnerability by continuously assessing the, uh, the systems and spotting uh, red flags. When it comes to effective training and education, which is the only way forward uh, that will enable a company to be able to defend uh, itself towards a cyber attack, this should be, this should be carried out uh, on a company and SIP specific basis. Um, I was recently reading about a survey that was carried out a couple of years ago among seafarers. And uh, what it has been revealed there, it was only 15% of those CFRs have actually uh, been given any uh, form of uh, cybersecurity training. And uh, this training was predominantly being provided by the mining agencies before the CFR was leaving to, uh, to go to join uh, the next uh, vessel. And in that instance, unfortunately, the, uh, the cyber training was not uh, specific either to the company or to the vessel that the specific CFR was about to join. 
so the um, the million dollar question is how should the PNI uh, insurance respond uh, uh, to a cyber risk events once that it materializes? Uh, obviously, it's in every case uh, should be dealt with based on its own facts. But in order to give you a few examples, we'll go through uh, a few scenarios, some of them uh, based on uh, uh, the scenario already uh, given to you by, uh, by Dennis. And uh, the aim is to be able to provide with some guidance on the PNI and uh, FDNT cover. Uh, so, in the first uh, scenario, we have an occasion where the electronic chart display and information system of, uh, of a vessel has been infected by a cyber attack at loading port. Um, unfortunately, these days, uh, more and more vessels are only uh, rely on electronic charts and don't carry any paper charts. Um, so in this occasion, the vessel could be ready to sail, loaded, but unfortunately, until this issue with the electronic chart display and information system is uh, resolved by the technical assistance, the vessel remains at the loading port. So there's a loss of uh, there's a loss of uh, uh, time. So in the contractual context of uh, of this scenario, this vessel has been fixed on an IP 1946 uh, form where the off-hire clause provides that in an event of loss of time from breakdown or damages to machinery equipment or by any other cause preventing the full working of the vessel, the payment of hire shall cease for the time thereby lost. So obviously we will, the owners will have to face um, a claim by charters who would say that the vessel was not fit for service as it was not able to sail upon completion of loading and therefore they will allege uh, that time won't count as hire due that period. Uh, so in this occasion, uh, the respective uh, contractual parties, namely the owners and charterers, will refer this dispute to their respective FD&D insurance for resolution. And in this occasion, FD&D cover will be triggered and legal assistance is to be provided uh, and uh, cover any legal fees that may be required for resolution of this matter. On the PNI front, though, in the occasion that the cargo loaded is a perishable one, and therefore the delay incurred uh, due to the technical problem resulting from the cyber attack results to a damage to cargo at the discharge port, the PNI cover will be triggered and will respond uh, as usually. And that is to, to deal and uh, cover the cargo damage. Claims. And in the occasion there is a request for security, the club will also provide one. Uh, in, the, in the scenario number two, uh, we have a situation where there is a hacking of, uh, of a company system, um, let's say the, the owners or, or the charterers. So the payment of, uh, of hire from one uh, from the charters to the owners is uh, misdirected into the personator's uh, bank account. Uh, so we are talking about an act of fraud, which uh, causes economic uh, losses. Uh, but these losses uh, will fall outside the PNI cover. Uh, and therefore, in this occasion, FDND service uh, will be able to stand by uh, the parties and take any possible legal action uh, in order to be able to recover those misdirected uh, fees. And uh, Going forward to a next, uh, the next scenario, which has to do with the malware accidentally installed to the vessel's navigation system by a seafarer with the use of an infected uh, USB stick. Potentially, that could result in the occurrence of uh, a serious incident such as a casualty collision, uh, oil pollution, um, or serious uh, crew injury. The common element here is the, is the human error and uh, crew negligence is covered by PNI cover. So the PNI cover will be triggered uh, in order to cover any third party liabilities uh, arising out of uh, such an incident. Uh, what's important to know, it's uh, such an event could have been prevented though, if specific training and strict procedures have been implemented across all personnel, both ashore and on board. 
And our last scenario is uh, based on the one that uh, Dennis shared with you before, and it has to do with the offshore supplies vessel, uh, which uh, system is hacked while on uh, station servicing an offshore production platform. Um, the offshore uh, vessel loses uh, control of a dynamic positioning system, and it uh, causes uh, damages, uh, collides with another uh, platform. Uh, there is an incident of fire on board, which results to injured uh, seamen on board the supply vessel. So again, uh, we have uh, two aspects uh, of uh, how we will deal with that. The first one is uh, the PNI aspects. And uh, again, uh, uh, the PNI cover will be triggered and be able to cover any third party liabilities uh, arising out of uh, with the, with the collision and the damage to platform B, uh, the injury incurred by the, the seafarers, and uh, any uh, um, pollution uh, related uh, uh, damages as a cleaning up cost or any fine that may be imposed uh, to the vessel. Uh, when it comes to FD&D cover and uh, if there's a contractual uh, dispute between uh, the vessel and uh, the interest or platform A, uh, who have chartered the vessel to deliver supplies and that didn't materialize, then the FD&D cover will be able to provide a system and cover any um, legal fees as uh, necessary. So due to the extensive uh, development of uh, the cyber risks, uh, various uh, maritime organizations such as uh, IMO, ITER Tango, ITER Cargo and BIMCO have uh, responded also by issuing guidance and initiatives to the industry. The last initiative taken by BIMCO is the issuance of the cybersecurity clause uh, in the middle, uh, the middle of uh, 2019 which actually aims to spread awareness to all contractual parties, uh, owners, charters, and brokers, in order to push them to develop robust systems, which uh, will not only eliminate the risk of a cyber incident uh, occurring, but would also mitigate the adverse effects in case such an incident uh, does occur. And uh, quite importantly, will also uh, prevent reoccurrence of uh, such an incident. Uh, that uh, clause is suitable for, uh, for to inclusion in a wide range of uh, maritime contracts and uh, requires the parties to share relevant information. So I would say, and uh, aiming to, to sum up uh, the presentation, the, takes, the takeaways are that uh, although there is uh, uh, no exclusion within the um, IG group uh, rules uh, when it comes to cyber security, uh, we, we all need to have in mind that uh, the, the PNI cover will not be able to respond and cover each and every scenario. So therefore, um, ship owners need to act as prudent and insured and take initiatives in order to create a robust cyber environment within the, their organization by developing training procedures and education at all levels uh, of the operations, which need to be relevant to the specific needs of their companies. So hopefully that will assist us all to stay cyber safe. Thank you very much. Thank you for that excellent presentation, Alina. Um, very interesting. And, and as, you know, as a reminder to all of our members that basically we do not exclude uh, cyber risks, uh, uh, except for uh, war and terror-related matters. But again, that's the role of PNI to try to be more inclusive in the risks that we actually cover. So, uh, thanks again, Alina, for that presentation. Now, I'd just like to do <clears throat> a short summary on our loss prevention initiatives that we've been working on uh, of late and uh, over the last uh, couple of years, and in particular, some of the things we've been doing with with ABS Group. Uh, and Ian's group uh, been cooperating on a number of, of documents. But let me just start by saying, let me get my screen up here. Sorry. Uh, screen. Uh, apologies here. And I'm switching my screen. I don't know. Oh, 
display. There we are, my apologies. Um, I'd just like to say that the American Club, what we've done is that we've dedicated a section to of our website uh, to cybersecurity, of which we'll be adding more information uh, as it comes, comes about. And I'd like to first start with what we've done uh, a couple of years ago uh, with, I'm sorry, a little over a year ago, actually now, and not even quite a year ago with uh, cybersecurity time, time in the time in the COVID era seems to, to go by very fast or very slow. It's hard to keep abreast of when, what we're actually doing when we're doing it. But the, the cyber, actually the cyber awareness comic did, uh, uh, was released uh, during the pandemic, if I do recall, because we're still waiting for the actual uh, printouts, which we, which we apologize to all of our members and, and those who are interested in our cyber uh, comic book. But that is directed more towards uh, towards seafarers, although it is directed towards office staff, but it's really more of a lighthearted uh, way to present our information and, and uh, cyber awareness and, and, and uh, cyber health and these types of things that we'd hope that seafarers would be more uh, attuned to. Uh, and also you'll see uh, to the left and to the right of, of the cyber awareness comics uh, on the, or comic on the bottom, uh, let me start on the right with our primer, uh, ABS group, uh, Ian and his, uh, Ian and Dennis and their group did an excellent uh, primer on cyber uh, risk management that we, that is on our website. And I do believe it's also on the ABS group website. Uh, but we strongly recommend that you, that you look at that uh, document. Uh, and there, uh, there are very uh, poignant or very important information with regard to uh, our cyber awareness and preparation uh, for what's forthcoming as of January of 2021. What's coming is the uh, adaptation or the resolution, IMO resolution, uh, basically recommending that members, or sorry, that ship owners uh, incorporate uh, cyber, cyber security into their risk management profiles for their, uh, for their compliance with the ISM code. So now we recommend that you uh, take a look at that document. And also to the left, just based upon the things that we've been talking a lot about today uh, between ABS Group and the American Club, we uh, produced another document looking at uh, a lot of what Alina presented today, uh, but in writing, talking about the case studies, talking about the risks, what's covered, what's not, types of situations that you may, that may arise uh, that would be, uh, uh, and how it would be dressed, addressed in a PNI and an FDND uh, uh, perspective. So just a last minute comment on the law, uh, the American Club, we maintain a website, or we maintain on our website, a plethora of information on all kinds of loss prevention related matters uh, in publication format, uh, the circulars, alerts, comics, uh, guidance documents, uh, e-learning tools, and best, best practices animations. Uh, we maintain those. Uh, we've done a couple. Of, uh, we've done. Uh, we have quite a library of loss prevention uh, related uh, uh, e-learning tools, and also our library of animations on steel, bunkering, uh, and uh, rice cargo uh, 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 loading. We also have, again, all of our loss prevention materials are right there available on our website, uh, at the website that you see below, or please contact me directly. Uh, any information you need, we will get back to you in the shortest time possible. Uh, it's best to send it to me in an email and or text. So thank you for uh, your attention uh, today. What I'd like to do is, as you, we mentioned earlier, uh, let me get out of my my, uh, sorry. What I'd like to uh, to take any uh, questions that may, that you may actually have. Uh, as again, we have on the bottom, we have a Q and A. Uh, we welcome your, any inputs that you may have. And in addition, but what I'd like to do is to start with a couple of questions. If uh, in the meantime, uh, I'd like to start with you, Ian. 
if you don't mind, we didn't get a chance to chat with you very much today, but um, at this point in time with, is it, you know, the customers, the customers are approaching you basically because they've had a, a cyber, uh, cyber experience or they're talking to other other ship owners and they've had a cyber experience because ship owners talk uh, and or is it something that you're just they're just being proactive what do you find the industry really the responses from the industry when you're uh, when you do hearing from from ship owners thanks for that. um <clears throat> we're seeing it from a number of different areas there's actually a number of factors driving this um interest and awareness. One is the, the number of attacks are on the increase, both within our industry and within adjacent industries. So if you look at some of the industries like oil and gas or other areas, mm. they're a little bit farther along and you can see the attacks forming there. Those are the kind of attacks that are gonna start edging their way into, into our environment. Um, some already have. Um, our industry is sort of notorious about not sharing that kind of information. Um, so it's more one-on-one -on -one when we're dealing with, with customers in different areas, but it is certainly uh, have had attacks and those are forming. One of the things about those attacks you should be aware is that when they started out, these attacks, they were more IT attacks that they were bringing over. So information technology attacks. Now they're starting to make more custom attacks for the OT environment. And eventually there'll be more custom attacks for the OT environment for maritime. So that's kind of the way it evolves. And the customers are seeing the frequency and the potency of tax increase. It's one of the reasons why they call us in. But you also have regulatory environment um, that is also increasing. You can look to adjacent industries, how that vectors out. But we have IMO, for example, that guidance, that point of emphasis that's happening now. Well, that's the first part of it. Um, that usually, the regulatory environment usually lags the other piece because it takes a little while to to, 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 to come in, um, but you'll see it over time start edging out. So there's another pressure in there. And then the third one re reason why we're seeing is digitalization. Lots of digitalization, digital transformation going on. A lot of um, companies really want to take advantage of that, feel they need to for competitive advantage. Um, so all that's all the automation, that's all the IoT, uh, that's all the data that you want from your operations to run more smoothly. These all give you great competitive advantages, but they also increase what we call the attack service, the ways bad guys can get in. And you really, if, if um, you look at digitalization as a market reality, then you need to consider um, cybersecurity as a business imperative, meaning it is just part of doing business. So where maybe a year and a half ago, people were saying, should I do cyber? Should I do this? Now they're saying they're beyond that question. That's no longer the question right now. It's what do I do? So it's not should I do, it's how do I do this? What do I do next? Where do I get started? Those are the kinds of questions we're starting to get now and wanting to you know, show that path along that way. But it's really those three factors that are, that are coming into play. Thanks Ian. Um, just a follow-up question. Uh, something came in on the q and It says, based on Mr. Bramson's comment, have any of you seen custom attacks that are designed to provoke specific response or to do specific air damage. Based upon so, Mr. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so on that front, so again, as they become more customized, if you look at adjacent industries, for sure, you're seeing that oil and gas, you look at the Triton attack and those other kind of things, they're very specific. That particular attack, just so you know, attacked a safety system and it was trying to block the safety system so it looks like everything's normal, kind of what Dennis was saying and then people will come in and do the true attack. Adjacent industry, again, that's where those are starting to really form out, but you can see as they start pouring in what happens, right? Mm -hmm. With the amount of goods and the amount of damage and the amount of um, target opportunity, I guess, for a hacker, putting in the hacker hat, that our industry represents, it's just a matter of time where those go. Do we see specifically highly developed, customized pieces in here? They're more, they're much more simple than that right now. Much of the issues, many of the issues right now are simple cyber hygiene. You can do a lot to protect right now doing some basics of training that we talked mm -hmm. about, segment your market, do some basic discipline, and you're actually doing okay right now. Now you have to always stay ahead of these things, but you'll see that a lot of the attacks that are coming in aren't that sophisticated because quite frankly, they don't need to be. 
Thanks, Ian. Um, I'd like to move to Dennis for a moment. Um, it's interesting watch, looking at your case studies. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, when you when you talk to ship owners, basically they're surprised on how easy it is and looking at, you know, knowing their own technological systems, looking at what they actually have, saying, you know, a bit surprised by how easy it is to actually access their systems. I mean, do you have those, do you, do you get that response at times? Uh, yeah, so... Um, <laughs> I think we, we, we've talked about this one before, you know, in several mm -hmm. meetings. Um, so a lot of times the, uh, let, let's say those in charge, um, maybe not the crew or maybe who who's in charge on the crew, they think that the secure, uh, the security is there. So they might think that just because um, the VSAT provider or whomever has some kind of a security appliance installed or some kind of security software installed that they're fine or they're using software like team viewer and that's a secure software to connect to manage the it components in these systems so they're secure um but uh it just takes a little bit of effort just to show them why why it's not secure and yeah that so they're they're typically surprised uh <laughs> when they do that however i i think they i think they know it already <laughs> uh. You know, I, we, we also got a, a question here uh, that I think probably your best. At. I mean, just something pretty straight and basic and, and Ford, maybe you might be able to give us a recommendation on is basically how crews prevent USB containing malware from getting used on board. We're, we're kind of, and, and we're asking that question for ourselves because, you know, we've been sending out a lot of uh, USB sticks. We, we, we're very certain that they're clean, but we know that a lot of ship owners probably aren't even allowing now are allowing USBs on board ship. But what are your thoughts on there? What do you recommend that crews would do to prevent that if if there's anything? Well, we we actually have um, a kind of a cradle to grave process um, that we recommend. And it does take a, a behavior change to to implement the process. But it starts with how you manage what gets brought on board through your management of change. And it's something as simple as changing your, your onboarding procedures to ask for or to basically inspect for, but you're not interrogating. So, you, you know, to inspect for USB or, or other removable media. Um, and it should uh, evolve into scanning portable media for viruses on a dedicated scanning machine now we've actually seen this implemented uh, where some organizations have a business PC. That means a PC that's used for administrative purposes that already has antivirus on it, just uh, to plug in that device, just to do a scan before it gets plugged into, yeah, before okay. it gets plugged into any, any other media. And then also confiscating devices that aren't allowed or that the, the OEM does not allow. And that, that turns into a problem because uh, most organizations are afraid to do that, especially with their support vendors and so on. Sure. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I have a question for you now, Alina. We haven't forgotten you. <laughs> um, okay, good to know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting about this BIMCO clause. I, uh, you know, BIMCO has a number of clauses that they put out. They try to stay ahead of things, you know, and cyber is, is, is no different. Um, but what's been the... What's been the industry reception to the BIMCO clause? Has it been uh, good, bad? Is it indifferent? Are people using it? Is it uh, being, uh, yeah. Anyway, any thoughts on that that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, I mean, generally there's, there's a good feeling about the BIMCO clause. Uh, obviously some fixtures are predating the day that, uh, um, that they're still ongoing, that the date that the actual clause has been uh, released. And again, it has to do with uh, with awareness and uh, and training. So people need to get familiar with all cyber uh, risks, um, you know, guidelines, and understand how the whole mechanism are going to protect them. 
So uh, an owner or charter may take uh, individual measures within their companies to protect themselves vis-a-vis -vis a cyber attack and not yet to realize how important is actually the collaboration mm -hmm. between the contractual parties in dealing with cyber attacks. And that's exactly the aim of, uh, of uh, the BIMCO clause, to actually make the parties to collaborate uh, between themselves. So it's not only the appreciation of the cyber attack risk, but also people need to understand uh, the value of collaboration when they are uh, within the context of a contract Understood. where the BIMCO clause can, uh, can be used. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. Excellent response. Uh, one other thing I'd like to, to ask you, Alina, uh, questions come in on the Q&A, whether we've seen any as, as a senior claims executive for the company, and we've discussed this, I'm sure it's discussed within uh, organization. Have we seen any events, any cyber related events that have uh, on the claim side? Um, yes, I'm, I'm afraid we have, I'm afraid we have. I mean, we have seen occasions uh, for sure, bank accounts have been hijacked, and uh, when the owner tries to pay his uh, service supplier, the, uh, the shipyard for, uh, some repairs that have been carried out. Uh, there's interception of uh, of the email account and the bank account, and the funds have uh, you know directed uh, to the hackers' bank account. And uh, in, in that effect, we have been trying to assist from the FTND uh, mm -hmm. aspects in trying to recover these misdirected uh, funds. Thanks, Alina. Is that, so most of the cases we've seen have been more on the FTND side, without those types of events than something that's been uh, on a PNI side, like some uh, examples. Yes, Th thankfully, so no big uh, casualty has incurred out of a okay. cyber attack on one of our members' uh, vessels so far. Okay. Thanks, Alina. You're welcome. Floor's open for any more questions on the Q&A. If you'd like to send something, uh, I'll give you a moment, but seems not. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers today. Uh, Ian Bramson, uh, Dr. Dennis Hackney, and our one and only Alina Soli. We've done an um, excellent job in actually furthering my knowledge on the subject. And uh, hopefully it's done the same, uh, our, our uh, speakers have done the same for all of you today, all participants. And we thank you for spending the time to sit with us at uh, today's um, era of viruses and uh, some, or a webinar on the subject of cybersecurity. Thanks again for your attention and be safe, everyone. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you.